you guys are excited. Can we just thank our worship team one more time? And we can, can we thank Mez as well? Mez Raim. Uh, if you guys don't know who I am, my name is John Sparrow. I serve as lead pastor here at Equippers. Uh, now just coming up on just past eight years. Um, we've been in Equippers Church for just over eight years, and uh, we're just thrilled uh, what God's doing uh, on the Central Coast. We believe it's a worthy cause to be part of his church for such a time as this. Amen. Uh, I'm married. I have a wife uh, almost 11 years. Next week, it'll be 11 years. Um, yeah. And we have produced four children. Uh, that's the fruit of our relationship so far. And uh, probably will just be the fruit of our relationship for, um, I think we're good. <laughs> um, let's go to the Bible. We're going to continue uh, this series called Fit for This. And uh, we're going to continue on uh, right through 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're picking up in verse 8. Uh, the Bible says, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure with him, we also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we ask right now that we would uh, receive, like Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, the spirit of wisdom and revelation so we might know you. And I just ask that, Holy Spirit, you'd come and illuminate truth for us, that you would encourage the hearts that are discouraged today. You'd lift our heads, our eyes to see what's to come in the glorious future that you have for us. Lord, I thank you right now uh, that those who don't know you and don't walk with you and happen to be under the sound of my voice would somehow, some way, by your word, uh, the lights would come on to understand what's on offer in the kingdom of God. And so we thank you for what you're doing in the nations, in our nation, in our community, our region, right here at home. We just love you and we believe that you have a glorious future in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, to set a little context again for the series that we've been a part of, the, the series is titled Fit for This. And it's based on this premise that uh, Jesus Christ didn't send his, uh, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word condemned itself means not fit for use. And so if you've ever uh, traveled through like an earthquake zone or you've seen an old dilapidated building somewhere, you might see a red sign on the front of that building with the words condemned, the word condemned, because that building is no longer fit to occupy. It's no longer able to function as it was intended to function. And the reality is, is that we walk through our Christian life and the enemy continues to breathe these lies that we're not fit for use in his kingdom, that we're not fit for the things that God had for us. But the Bible is very clear that Jesus didn't to come to condemn the world and to point the finger that you are a victim to your sin. No, he came to save us. He didn't just come to save us from our sin, but he came to save us for a purpose. And so a, a few biblical definitions before I get into it too far. Justification, if you're taking notes and haven't been here the last few weeks, this is the reality or the technical term for this, this reality that you have been saved. We are so thankful that Jesus Christ has justified us, that he has made us fit by his sacrifice. And then there's this word, sanctification, this process. So you have been saved, but how many know that you are being saved? You are on a journey, you are in a process. We never graduate until the day we see Jesus face to face. We are being saved and ultimately is glorification. You will be saved. There is a day when we will see him and we will be made like him. There's a day the book of Revelation says in chapter 21 when he'll wipe away every tear, that he'll make all wrong things right, that he will rule and reign and no longer will sin be the stain on humanity. And so those are a few technical terms and Ultimately, this series is, is focusing on the process of sanctification. This reality that you've been made fit by what Jesus has done, but you're being made fit for what he has for you. So you have been made fit and you are being made fit. And I, I've been so thankful for this series and the way that we've been able to journey through Paul's letter to Timothy. 
This is Paul's last letter that he writes before he dies. This is kind of the final words, if you will. And so we just take heed to the final words of Paul and what he would say to Timothy. Timothy's a young leader. And the reality is, is that he's been given some prerequisites of who he would entrust the leadership in the church of Ephesus. And we get some keys here. And so if you haven't been here, this is just a recap. But we first talked about the soldier. The soldier works to please his commanding officer and he doesn't get entangled in civilian affairs. You guys remember that? So, so long ago, a whole three weeks ago. Uh, then there's the athlete. The athlete competes according to the rules. And uh, Pastor Pat did a wonderful job of explaining that that would be love according to a pure heart, clear conscience, and a sincere faith. That's how you play according to the rules. And then the farmer, we talked last week, works hard and waits well, knowing they will have a share in the crop. And so this is where we've tracked so far. And if you're reading through 2 Timothy, there's, these are obvious distinctions, but the next one isn't so obvious. But I feel like it wouldn't be a faithful teaching of Scripture if we left out this last one, which is the prisoner. <laughs> the reality is, is that sometimes your conditions will not improve. Have a great day. <laughs> Paul goes on, we're, we're going to read it here. As he says this, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. Just like the certainty of death and taxes is the certainty of, yes, God's incomparable goodness, but also our unexplainable suffering. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, and if we are children then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. If you haven't suffered, you will. And if you have, it means you're a legitimate child of God <laughs> because the Bible says you, you can't associate with him unless you experience some sort of suffering in this life. And so it wouldn't be faithful to go on this prerequisite for leadership given to Paul if we didn't talk about this reality of suffering. And uh, this is the reality for Timothy. So, so Paul's instructing Timothy, and Paul is right now in jail. If you've ever been to Rome, uh, there's this incredible, what's the name of that pathway, Dad, that we went down uh, right across from the Colosseum? You, you go down the Nope, not the Via de la Rosa. That's in Israel. Uh, um, <laughs> you get to see his prison. So <laughs> you get to see Paul's prison. This is in, yeah, downtown Rome, downtown, next to that, next to that killer wine bar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, we've had the, the opportunity um, uh, to actually see the prison uh, that Paul was enslaved in, in Rome, when he's writing these final thoughts. And he's giving this instruction to Timothy, uh, wanting to emphasize, hey, Timothy, if you're commi committed to the gospel, if you're proclaiming in the face of civilization and all they had known that there is a new kingdom and a new king that sits on the throne, it, it's very well might be your lot that you end up right here in these same chains. So I need you to understand that this is, part of the deal here. Be a soldier, work, you know, work hard like a farmer, compete like an athlete, but be fully aware that there may be a moment when you end up in chains like a prisoner. This might be the result. And, and history would show, it's not written in the Bible, but if we study Timothy's life, that not too long after this, he made the attempt in Ephesus to stop a pagan procession. And in that moment, he was martyred. He was killed for the gospel of Jesus in the face of pagan opposition. And so there's a little bit of weight to this when Paul's instructing Timothy that it might actually end this way. And I want to be clear that there's, there's different types of suffering found in Scripture. And I'm going to talk about one specifically, but there's some suffering uh, in this life that's just self-inflicted because we made bad choices, right? Like I shouldn't have had that milkshake last night because I really feel it today. You know, like I didn't actually, if my wife is listening, um, I did not have a milkshake last night. It was an illustration I did go to Menchie's again by myself uh, Saturday night. That's two weekends in a row. Saturday night, I like finished my sermon. I feel like I deserve a little treat. Uh, and then I go to Menchie's by myself. So, 
<laughs> what are we talking about? I did that. Just confession. Blood of Jesus cleanses you. But suffering, some suffering self-inflicted. Like you just, you're, you just made a bad choice. Some suffering is actually inflicted by God in response to rebellion, if you read your Bible. Some suffering is demonic with the intent to steal, kill, and destroy. Some suffering will not fit neatly into any category because it is tragically unexplainable. And that's part of the tension that we live in. The suffering Paul specifically talks about here is this type of suffering. It's suffering for the sake of others. The Bible says in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. There's a type of suffering that is willful in the sake of others. So to understand context here, Paul's actually in prison to take on the heat, to take fire, to put his own neck out there, to, take, to, to be the distraction so that the young church around him can flourish. He is submitting himself to change so that this young church can grow and develop. They can become strong in faith and in hope. He has his eyes not set just on the present age of his temporary comforts, but he's fixed on the age to come and what God might do. Um, in, in 2018, uh, my wife and I, we lived uh, like 15 lifetimes in one year. You ever had a year like that? Like everything that could poss possibly happen happens in that one year. And uh, we were in the middle of uh, being foster parents with the process to adopt. And uh, my wife was pregnant at the time. And we found out that our, our, our daughter uh, now, who we were working to adopt, had an incurable disease. And so we ended up, you know, in different hospitals. My wife was eight months pregnant, nine months pregnant, sleeping in hospital rooms and then gave birth on the 13th of May. And then seven days later, our other daughter, who was six months old, uh, her name came up on the list to receive a liver transplant. And uh, then we're still in the middle of the adoption process. So it was just like a whole bunch of stuff that was like crammed into one. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a little bit intense. Um, and I got worked. Uh, I didn't do well. <laughs> And uh, coming off the backside of that, I, I, I just was disoriented and I, I was having a really hard time kind of reengaging. And, and so I met with a, a pastor friend of mine who I knew had gone through a similar circumstance with a medically fragile child and, and the whole thing. And he got to, we got to talking and I just began to pour out my heart. And the reality is I was living with this tension on the inside uh, this question that like, if I'm doing all this stuff for God, then why does it hurt so bad? <laughs> like we're doing a good thing. We're, we're adopting and, you know, trying to help out, you know, and, and we're having babies. It's like what God said to do, you know, like we're, we are in the very will of God. Why does it hurt so bad? Do you ever feel the same way? And I, I'll never forget what my friend said back to me. He, he said, well, it hurts so bad because you are a buffer. A buffer meaning that you are taking the weight and every arrow that was intended to steal, kill, and destroy on your child's life. We had inserted ourselves into the storyline of a child who was destined to end up in a drug addict environment. We inserted ourselves into a moment of time to be the buffer between every curse that was against her and every blessing that God wanted to bless her with. And so he said, you're, you're a buffer. You, you willfully put yourself in a position that hurts really, really bad. And so you, like, you got to ask, why would someone do that? Why do Christians do that all the time? I, I get so encouraged when we've been involved in the foster system here in San Luis Obispo County that the church is the number one provider for foster care in our county. The, the leading voice in foster care is Family Care Network, a, a faith-based organization that's helping young kids thrive. But it's the most painful process that anyone could ever walk through. Why would you insert yourself as a buffer into someone else's lives? And I can guarantee you that it hurts really bad. But this is what I found, that it hurts, but heaven comes close to the hurting. That there's something about hurting and suffering for others that is really attractive to the presence of God. Paul uses this, this term here. He says, for which I'm suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. He says, but God's word is not chained. And 
This isn't just the reality that God's word was spreading throughout the region of Ephesus, and it should have been really encouraging of what was happening in the surrounding regions. I mean, the word of God was unchained. It was continuing to flourish even though Paul was in chain. But if you've studied this, you'd realize that right here in this moment, Paul is digging deep into his Jewish heritage. He's digging deep into the entire biblical narrative of how God's word had served as the comfort for people imprisoned and in bondage and enslaved to a pagan culture. And so he's, he's referencing like Isaiah 40, a voice cries out, it says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass and all their faithfulness is like flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fail. Because of the breath of the Lord blows on them, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fail. But it says this, but the word of our God endures forever. And then Isaiah 55 says, the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my what word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Yes, the word is going forth and bearing fruit in the region, but ultimately the word is going forth and bearing fruit in Paul's life. He, he sees himself shackled in chain, but the word of God is not restricted even in his chains. There's a promise in it. And then he gives us this new little song. People who study this would say, it, it may have been a song, if we suffer, we shall live. If we're patient, we shall reign. Deny him, he'll deny you. If we're faithless, he will be faithful he can't deny himself. And this was a little tool to put in the belt when trouble comes and suffering happens is to rehearse this song. And you could just imagine the early church and everything they were facing and the, the muttering of this sort of song, if we suffer, we'll live. If we're patient, we'll reign. Deny him, he'll deny you, watch out. If we're faithless, he's faithful for he can't deny himself. And I just wanna clarify here that I don't think faithless here means if, if we lose our faith in the sense of like ceasing to believe that Jesus is our Lord and that God raised him from the dead. I, I think you, you can't play with that um, and just say that God's going to be okay with your intentional denying of the faith. That's not what this is saying here. Um, I think this is meant to take an account that at times we lack faith. Our reliability, our stickability, our resolve, our determination to remain faithful in the sense of loyalty, it will waver and wobble from time to time. <laughs> when we come under intense pressure, whether political, spiritual, moral, whatever the circumstance may be, we will find ourselves weak, faint, and helpless. And if you don't, tell us your secret. It's at those times that people need to learn a second order kind of faith, a faith in faithlessness and reliability on only God himself, the God we know in and through Jesus, who was himself faithful even unto death. There is a commitment to you even in your wavering through intense pressure where he remains faithful. Uh, N.T. Wright says this, there is a world of a difference between blowing off the ship's deck by a hurricane and voluntarily diving into the sea to avoid having to stay at the helm. There's a difference <laughs> This is the faithful God who helps you when you're hanging on at the helm, regardless of the storm that's coming. He is faithful to sustain you. And so Paul, he's willing to take the heat on this because the word of God is going to sustain him, that, that he would stay a prisoner. He'd stay in chains. And he continues to say, or this is how he starts it. This is the prerequisite to being a prisoner. He says, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel. I uh, uh, was reading a book recently. The team can come. We're going to end with communion today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just preach a little bit short and then we're going to take communion. But the worship team can come and kind of fiddle around and um, <laughs> fiddle around. Is that what you do? <laughs> I mean, I just like. <laughs> Pun intended. Um, uh, a great resource uh, is a book called Prayer by Philip Yancey. Uh, he's a journalist, uh, author, just incredible insight, uh, super, super helpful. But in one of his chapters, he's writing about this guy named Charles Edward White, uh, who goes to the University of Jos in Nigeria. And just outside of the university grounds, there's a, a gravesite. 
and uh, he begins to kind of tour the gravesite, and he sees that it's a gravesite for missionaries who had given their lives to Nigeria. And one thing that he noticed that was, it was impossible to ignore is the amount of small graves. 33 of the 56 graves held the bodies of small children. These children died victim to different diseases uh, in that tropical setting, just kind of the different setting of Nigeria. And a few of them actually, there were stories of them drowning in a river nearby. And so Charles White, he, he's just pondering this tension that he's looking at. It's like these young innocent lives were lost at the hand of, of missionaries. Like people doing the good thing that God asked them to do and tragic things are happening. There's pain happening. There's suffering happening in response to their very obedience of going where God said to go. And, and he's trying to sum this up and he quotes in that book, Prayer. It says, the graveyard at Miongo tells us something about God and about his grace. It testifies that God is not a jolly grandfather who satisfies our every desire. Certainly those parents wanted their children to live. They, they pled with God, but he denied their request. The graves also show us that God is not calculating merchant who withholds his goods until we produce enough good works or faith to buy his help. If anyone had earned credit with God, it would have been these missionaries. They left all to spread the gospel in a hostile environment, but God does not hand out merit pay. Not only do we learn about God's nature from the Miongo graveyard, we also discover truths about His grace. God's grace may be free, but it is not cheap. Neither purchasing our salvation nor letting us know of the gift was inexpensive. Beginning with Abel, many of the witnesses to divine grace sealed the words with their blood. Jesus asked the Jews which of the prophets was not persecuted. When He first sent out His disciples, He promised them betrayal and death. Then at the end of his ministry, he promised his followers that as they carried his word, they would face trouble and hatred. This, this one gets me every time. The only way we can understand the graveyard at Miongo is to remember that God also buried his son on the mission field. There's this reality that Jesus is the one who suffered first. And we have to take the attitude of a soldier, we have to take the attitude of an athlete, we have to take the attitude of a farmer, but ultimately we have to understand that there is a high price to following Jesus. That, I don't know, we might not end up in a prison cell, we might not actually be martyrs, but I want us to understand that as we lay our lives down for other people, we are submitting ourselves to an incredible type of pain, but I want to encourage you that heaven is really close to the earth. Ultimately, we have this model in Jesus himself, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. John 10, 17 and 18, the reason my father loves me is that I laid down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father, 1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid his life down for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is how we remember Jesus. Like Paul instructs Timothy, remember Jesus descended from David, the one who suffered first, the one who endured, the one who became the buffer between what you deserve and the grace you have received. So in just a moment, we're gonna receive communion. Um, actually our team, can, you can start passing the elements. Uh, Communion is a, is a sacrament. That word sacrament means uh, a sacred mystery revealed. And so when we receive the elements, it's, it's the, the worst little cracker you've ever tasted in your whole life. And uh, this little grape juice. And uh, the beautiful thing is that, that this is the, the mystery of God revealed. It's, it's grace uh, to see. It's, it's grace on display. It's it's the body, it's the blood of Jesus in a tangible manner where we get to, like Paul instructed Timothy, to remember Christ, to, to remember the sacred mystery that he served as the buffer first. I, I, I don't know, knowing the end of Timothy's life and the way that things wrapped up, I just have to imagine that somehow recounting the story of Jesus was the thing that led him to be faithful to the very end. This is what Paul means by... The word of God is unchained. It's because we remember who's gone before us. We remember what he has done. And in light of that and reflection of that, there's no length that we won't go to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to lay our lives down for those 
people around us. And I don't know what buffer God's called you to be, but I'd imagine in your sanctifying work that in the process of becoming more like him, he will absolutely knock on your door with an invitation to be some type of buffer. And it's gonna hurt. But I just don't think it'd be faithful to to welcome you into a faith without explaining that, that there's hurt and suffering involved, but that God is really faithful in that process. That the difference between suffering as a non-believer and suffering as a believer is that when you suffer as a believer, God is right there with you. And isn't that good news? That he's really faithful even when we're faithless. That if we, if we die with him, we'll live with him. If we join with him in the reconciling work of the world, there is life and life more abundantly and we get to fix our eyes on the author and the perfecter, the one who the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So as we receive communion, if we could stand together. The soldier wants to please their commanding officer and doesn't get entangled in civilian affairs. And the athlete, they're just playing by the rules. You gotta do it. The farmer, work really hard, believe that there's a reward on the other side. The prisoner, you need a vision of Jesus. This isn't help, self-help. This isn't project you. This isn't 10 steps to, to live your best life now. I need a revelation of Jesus and the work that he's done on my behalf so that I can do the work on others' behalf. And so with eyes closed and heads bowed before we receive communion together, I just wonder if there's anybody in this room today who's never responded to the good news of the gospel. The good news that Jesus saw you fit to die for out of his abounding love for you. The Bible says in Romans 5 that, well, you are an enemy to him. You are of no use. You are worthless in your sin and your shame. God chose to die because he loves. And if you've never experienced that old life to new life, kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light type of transformation, I want to invite you that here and now could very well be that moment when you exchange what was for what God has. When you confess Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, the Bible says that he will take your stony heart, the heart that can't feel or perceive, and he'll give you a heart of flesh that's sensitive to his spirit. And ultimately he comes and he writes his law on your heart so that you can walk according to his good pleasure and not the gratification of your flesh. And so if that's you, you've never made that decision, or maybe you know right now, if you are taking inventory, you're, you're not walking with Jesus. I just wanna tell you with as much boldness as I can, you're really missing out. <laughs> you wanna do this with him. There's suffering either way, do it with him. There's challenge any way, any, any way you do it, you just make it count. Make it count for other people. You never know what other people are gonna walk through that God wants you to walk through with. So if that's you today, I'm just gonna ask you to do something as a physical sign of an inward decision is just to, to lift your hand in response to the invitation. If that's you today, say, I wanna make a decision to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I wanna follow him. I wanna give my life to Jesus and trust that he would make me new, that I'd receive his sacrifice on my behalf. That, I just acknowledge he died the death so I don't have to. If that's you, would you just give me a little wave before we receive communion together and we can pray together. We never want to leave here without extending that invitation. If that's you today, just give me a wave and we're going to proceed. We're going to pray anyway, so you're not wasting anybody's time. Don't worry. We love to pray around here. But hey, before we receive communion, can, can we all pray this prayer together as a church? Can we do that? You can be vocal. Can we do that? Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin. Today I repent. I turn towards you. I trust you with my past. I trust you with my present. And God, I look to you for my future. I thank you that in you, all things are made new. And I thank you for the generous gift of your Holy Spirit. Make room 
would you come and do whatever you want to do in me, through me, and for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said, amen. How good. Yeah, we can celebrate. You can happy, happy clappy. That was terrible. That was absolutely, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Yo, your hands are full. You can't clap. No offense taken. Fully understandable. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, in light of this, that Jesus himself laid down his life for us, we're going to receive communion. We don't do it as some reflection on history of a figure that lived and died and ascended to some far off place. We receive communion with the full reality that his blood still cleanses that his life that was laid down still serves as the atoning sacrifice for our life, that any day, any moment, any time when someone calls upon his name, they're saved. Any time, any moment when someone pleads the blood of Jesus, he comes and purges our conscience from all dead works. It's, it's alive and it's active here and now. So as we receive communion together, we don't do it lightly in reflection. No, we apply the sacrifice of Jesus to our lives here and now because the older I get, the more I realize that I just need him. I need him every day, I need him every moment, I need his cleansing work to be active in my life. So if you have the elements, if does someone, uh, someone throw me a little? Uh, anyway, you can open the, um, that wafer. No, it's all right, they're, they're working on it. Taylor, let's see that arm. Thank you so much. If you can crack the code of getting that thing open. we take this bread in remembrance of Christ's body that was broken. The body that willingly put itself under the submission of wicked people to fulfill the work of God. The body that was beaten. So right now we receive this bread in remembrance of Christ's body that was broken. You can receive the bread. We receive this wine today, this cup, in remembrance of the blood that was poured out on our behalf, the blood that cleanses, the blood that heals. We already said it, but our hope is not in any sort of other God. Our hope is not in any sort of other solution that attempts to give a whole lot and delivers a whole little. Our confession today and what we remember is that Jesus Christ's blood was enough, is enough, and will always be enough. And so Lord, I ask right now for your anointing. I ask for your powers. Receive this blood. Would you do a deep work in us? We don't want to do it like we did last time. We don't, we don't want to just gather here for religious jargon. We're asking, Holy Spirit, would you come and exalt Jesus in our minds, our bodies, our spirit? Would you overwhelm us with your goodness as we receive this cup today? Church, you can receive the cup. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done on our behalf. You know, we know you've got a whole bunch of awesome stuff for us to do, to partner with you and soldiers, athletes, farmers, prisoners, the whole thing. I mean, this is so exciting what you have on offer for us in your kingdom. But right now, we just determine to take heed to what Paul said. Remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, descended from David, the one who himself spent his final hours and moments as a prisoner, the one who he himself gave everything on that cross willfully in obedience for the sake of other people. God, I ask right now, before we go into another moment of worship, that you would give us a fresh grace in places that are frustrating, in places that are really painful, that are hurtful, but somehow, God, are right in the middle of your will for the sake of other people. God, we just choose to turn every bit of pain into purpose for your kingdom, 
and unto the King. God, we ask that our lives would be a living testimony to those around us of what suffering well looks like, those who don't abandon the ship, those who lean into the faithfulness of God, hell or high water. God, we just commit to be those people who just believe that the word of God is not chained. It, it continues to nourish. It continues to encourage, encourage. It continues to sustain in the face of adversity. And God, I just ask in the increase of wickedness that the Bible talks about in our times, that according to Roman, uh, Matthew 24, 12, that our love will not grow cold. God, as the pressure from a pagan society increases, we'd be like Paul. No, I'm, I'm living on the inside. I'm flourishing in the midst of adversity. The gospel is still breaking out. Lives are still being transformed. My family loves God more today than they did yesterday. Lord, I thank you that that would be our confession as your people. We're not growing bitter. We're actually getting better. So Lord, I thank you. Would you help us to grow up into the full identity of what you have for us as a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, and also a prisoner. In Jesus' name I pray. We're going to sing this song one more time. But uh, I just want to maybe remind you that um, we can pass those. That's for your, your garbage. Isn't that nice? Thank you so much. Um, as a church, we, we like to worship. Um, and in uh, Romans chapter 12, Paul's instructing the, the Romans uh, that you would offer your lives as a, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And one kind of funny thing I was reminded of during prayer meeting this morning is that uh, a living sacrifice is funny because it, it, it gets up and runs off that altar sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but today, just in this last few moments of worship, we're putting our lives back on offer to God, putting our lives back out there in response to what he's done for us. And so I don't know what it looks like. I, I don't know what gets you a little bit uncomfortable, but maybe if we could just offer something a little bit radical in response to what Jesus has done for us in our worship. Can we do that? God, would you help us in our worship? God, would you provoke worship on the inside? Would you provoke love in our hearts? Would you provoke adoration in our hearts? So church, let, let's sing before we go. What can wash away my sin? Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope that that message was inspiring, encouraging, and hopefully equipped you for life. And if you're looking to get connected with Equippers Church, you can go to equipperscc.com slash connect, fill out a simple form, and someone from our team will be reaching out. You can find all kinds of opportunities to connect, to give, and receive prayer on our website, equipercc.com. And hey, we really hope to meet you in person sometime, see you in the room. But until then, keep tuning in. We hope that you are blessed by Equippers Church here on YouTube. Love you so much. God bless.